Good evening everyone. This is James Rattray, the chairman of the Soldiers of Killycranky. We're a local constituted group focused on our battlefield here. Um, I'm telling the story of the Battle of Killycranky using two books this evening. Cameron of Lock Hill's account of the battle and he's on the Jacobite side and we've got Mackay, the commander of the Scottish Government Army's account of the battle and we'll be using his account too. The, there is one new change since the last, last time. I've got a little furry object on my um, jumper here and that is a microphone and Rob in Australia kindly made that suggestion. I also need to say thank you to Eileen because to get a connection she lives here in Killycranky and also to my brother Hugh in South Wales. We've been testing it so hopefully you are you can hear me so if, if you can't hear me please put on there let us know. Um, but we're going to pro progress and I got my back to the wind because it's pretty windy at the moment. In the first six sessions we talked about the two monarchs, the monarchs, the two commanders, the two Scottish armies, why they were very different, the race for Castle Blair, the pass of Killycranky issues, how Dundee chooses the battlefield so successfully, 1680s warfare, and we're, the two armies battle lines and the pre-battle skirmish. And this is the eighth session and we're going to talk about the battle itself. And we're going to hear from both command, both sides of the, of the battle and hear what they tell us. On Sunday at seven o'clock we'll be discussing the aftermath again as seen by Cameron of Lochiel on the Jacobite side and the defeated General Hugh Mackay. What I want to do now is just show you where we are in Britain. So if I come up here, you can hopefully see us. This is um, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Inverness up here, and we're bang slap in the middle. And if we go to the battlefield, you can see uh, Blair Athol here. And this is where our first filming was. The Pass of Killycranky is down here. And the second one was near Soldiers Leap in the National Trust Centre. Third one was on the battlefield where we do our events, the big standing stone and the flat field. Fourth and fifth were here. Sixth where we were right up in the clan lines where the Jacobite clans lined up looking at the pass. Seventh where the skirmish was and tonight we've gone further along to the right wing of the um, Scottish Government Army, the Jacobite Army where they were standing. So the other angle I could probably show you is this one. So again, if you look at this evening, this is the A9 going through the battlefield. This is the um, government army, Mackay's army, William and Mary's army, lined up three deep by battalions right across the battlefield, just the other side of the A9. You've got Arad House here and the two troop of horse. And at the top here, we've got the clan regiments and this is where we're standing. Last time we were here where the skirmish field was, but we're here again. We're just, the clans are behind us and just the other side of the A9, you can see the government troops um, lined up. I think this must be one of the um, most beautiful battlefields that you can find um, in Scotland, in Britain. If you look at its location, um, the A9 was built through here in the 1970s and that divided the battlefield in two. In 2011 there was Scottish battlefield protection legislation put through and our um, government told us that this would protect battlefields such as this. Unfortunately as a community we believed that was the case and we only woke up halfway through the process to realise that Transport Scotland had all the cards and they could do virtually what they wanted. Um, Currently the situation is there's a Scottish government appointed reporter who's meant to be looking at the case from both sides. But what an opportunity we've missed instead of looking at our battlefield sensibly to see how we look after it. 
coronavirus has come along and so this is part of our lockup campaign is to talk about the battlefield we've seen a significant drop of traffic I suspect that drop will continue after we are allowed to move about and maybe the lack of money will mean that roads aren't such a high priority and hopefully what they'll do is they will use the money for parts of the road to make it safe but not necessarily duel it all in places like here and possibly burn them as well anyway let's get back to the battle both armies were lined up and we heard that Mackay last time was fearing a night attack from the the Jacobites up here on the hill and he, he thought that was the, the worst thing possible he also explained to us the helplessness of the situation he was in in that he had the river behind him the Jacobites clansmen the Highland clans breathing down his neck and he concluded he couldn't do anything other than sit and wait he couldn't influence the battle at all Mackay told us but shortly thereafter about half an hour before sunset the Highland clan regiments began to move down the hill the attack had started so half an hour before sunset 27th of July sunset here is about half past nine so about nine o'clock at night the army started to move I just want to stop before we go into the battle in detail and just remind ourselves of one or two things Lochiel gives us army the numbers of troops on the battlefield and he estimated that Mackay's army was 3,500 men and the clansmen had just under 2,000. And as I said to you before, the two armies reflect the society in Scotland at the time. One was a lowland society, Scots Gaelic, uh, Scots English um, speaking society, and the Highland clans were Gaelic, a totally different culture, language, and everything else. And this is where I'd just like to stop for a second before the battle and remind ourselves of a couple of things that the Highland army would have done. They were Gaels, um, they were clans, clans were very, saw themselves as, as an entity. Often clans would have their own battle cry um, and before they went into battle the, the Gaels would often remember their ancestors. They would say, you know, I'm on the battlefield as part of a whole lineage of people before me. So I'm the son of Peter, the son of Haldane, the son of Thomas, and they were before the battle communicating with their people from the past and saying, help me through this battle and guide me so I don't let all you who've gone before down. And so their approach was very different to lowland troops and to what we see today. The other big thing I want to just talk about was the Highland Charge. And these have been, this is associated with the Jacobite Wars and was seen as a de the decisive factor in the Jacobite Wars against regular troops. The origins of the Highland Charge are based on traditional Celtic ways of fighting and Alistair McCullough or Sir Alexander MacDonald was Montrose's right-hand man and he organised the Gaelic soldiers, both Scots and Irish, to maximise their fighting prowess. And he did this by having the heaviest and best armed men at the front, the clan gentlemen, the Dunya Usla. And we also understand that Dundee helped refine this tactic even further. And so what was the Highland charge? Speed was essential. Because if you think at that time, to fire a shot from a musket if you were good to fire one every minute so if you could get right in quickly once they'd fired their shot um, you stood a better chance so speed was essential preferably downhill and on firm ground they ran in clusters and groups often blood relatives together and hence the clansmen with the senior members of the clan at the front and once they were in musket range about 60 paces the clansmen would squat down, fire their muskets and then drop the firearms to the side and they would then draw their swords and rush upon the enemy. And that was the Highland Charge, that was the deciding factor throughout the Jacobite campaign with the slow firing muskets. So as we go into the battle, I'm going to start with Dundee's cavalry and Lochiel tells us from this story 
led to the ruin of the whole of this campaign. And so what happened with the Jacobite cavalry, he believes, resulted in the loss of the 1689 um, Jacobites um, campaign. So what he said was, the sun being near to its close, Dundee gave orders for the attack, telling the commanders as Maclean began to move on the right, that so Maclean was over here on my left hand side and he said as he began to move as the Maclean's moved the whole of the Jacobite army should move down the hill and they should advance upon the enemy. Dundee himself was in the centre with his horse which was then commanded by Sir William Wallace of Craigie and he now tells us a little story about the Jacobite horse. He said the gallant Earl of Dunfermline had formerly been in charge but that very morning Sir William Wallace had been presented a commission from King James to take charge of the cavalry and that noble Earl of Dunfermline, Dunfermline calmly resigned much to the dissatisfaction of Dundee and he goes on and this is his telling statement of from this small incident which is affirmed flowed the ruin and disappointment of that undertaking and from that I understand by his words he means the Jacobite campaign. So what I'd like to do now is just go back to the map and I'm going to show you the map with the clans coming down the hill. So just to remind ourselves the government armies along the bottom here and if you remember um, Lochiel told us each clan was assigned a regiment to attack. So the Maclean's, Louders, the Irish, Balfour's, Clan Ranald, Ramsey's, and you've got Glengarry, Kenmore, the cavalry down the middle, Clan Cameron, the Mackays, Hastings, with, with Clan MacDonald, and Levens, there was no clan to for them to attack. So they were going to come down the hillside like so, across the A9. And Lochiel tells us about the battle the Jacobite cavalry. When the horse had advanced to the foot of the hill down below us, and this is literally where the horse was coming down, this just the other side of that tree, this big flat slope that's going down. He said, once they advanced to the foot of the hill on which they were drawn, Sir William Wallace, either his courage failing him or some unknown accident interposed. Instead of marching forward after his general, and remember Dundee was on the horse, he ordered the horse to wheel to the left, which put them in confusion. So they were going down, all the clans were coming down against their respective regiments to attack, and all of a sudden William Wallace ordered them to wheel. And I'll c continue that story later, but let's bring in Mackay, and I'm going to have his, his hat, and I'm not going to put lock heels on because today is a very windy day. At least you'll know that I'm talking, is this the right way around? <laughs> I'm talking about the government army commander General Hugh Mackay. The general was already commanded, commanded his officers to begin firing at the distance of 100 paces by platoon. And he, he believed if, if they held their fire until the Jacobites were within 100 paces, there's a chance that they would be able to stop the Highlanders with this continual fire. And if you remember, he organized his line three deep. Normally on Europe, they would have been five deep so that they could fire and reload. Mackay didn't believe that was possible with the speed of the Highlanders. He himself, Mackay was a, was a Highlander and he knew how they would fire. So he wanted, by the time the clansmen got to the bottom, within a hundred paces, every musket to have been fired and so that the Highlanders would turn and run. And he continued, the part of the force, of their force opposite to Hastings, who was the right of all on the Jacobite right wing, including the general's um, own regiment, Levens and Ken Moores, came down risk briskly. So he's saying the clansmen on the far right hand side came down. But he actually goes on later on and we'll cover it. He says that the regiments on the left, which is where we're standing, didn't move at all. Well, we'll, 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 which is contrary to what Lochiel said. But Lochiel said, continuing 
he said uh, Dundee in the meantime intent upon the action of carrying on so this is talking about the Jacobite ho horse and Dundee Dundee in the meantime intent upon carrying on with the importance of, of his courage advanced towards the enemy's horse so the Jacobite cavalry with Dundee was attacking the enemy's horse in the center of the battlefield around our house where the artillery was positioned in the center without realizing without observing that Sir William Wallace and half his cavalry had not followed him he then says the Earl of Dunfermline and 16 gentlemen that's the cavalry that was left ignored the command of their colonel Sir William Wallace and followed their general as he entered the gunfire the smoke from the gunfire they observed him as he turned his horse towards the right and he raised up in the stirrups marking it making a signal and waving his hat over his head for the horse to come up Lochiel continues the enemy horse made little resistance so as the Jacobite cavalry went in the enemy Mackay's horse fell away and they were routed and warmly pursued by those few gentlemen and as to Wallace and the rest of the Jacobite cavalry that turned away they did not appear until all the action was over so we'll learn as we go on what happened to Dundee so going back to Mackay and I'm gonna see if I can just put this hat on to remind you who, who he was so Mackay the Scottish government armor commander said notwithstanding the fire particularly from Mackay's own battalion many chief gentlemen that by the name of Macdonald we actually know it was Clan Cameron he was mixed up here who attacked were killed <clears throat> but he said they pushed their point after they fired their light pieces fired their, their guns some distance which in his opinion made little or no execution and with sword in hand though in great confusion in their normal way attacked but Lochiel also makes a comment about the same um, attack and in it Lochiel said it is incredible with what intrepidity the Highlanders endured the enemy's fire though it grew more terrible upon their nearer approach this is firing by platoon exactly what Mackay wanted yet they within a wonderful resolution kept to their own and did not fire as they had been commanded until they came up to their very bosoms and then poured their fire their shot upon all at once like other like a great clap of thunder they drew away their guns and fell in pell-mell amongst the thickest of them with their swords <clears throat> and so what he was describing there was really the Highland charge they threw away their guns and in there and, they, and the next words I'm just going to ask you to consider what he describes here he said after this and after all the gunfire had finished it's, there seemed a hush and the fire ceasing on both sides nothing was heard for a few moments but the sullen and hollow clashes of broadswords and the dismal groans and cries of dying and wounded men just imagine if you know all of a sudden it comes to sword fighting and we'll see the effects of that later and so this is where I believe what's happened so they came down the, the different clans the Jacobite cavalry were here, yes, we're here. Um, with the horse the only ones that didn't have anyone was Levens regiment and they actually do a court to conversion they swing round to fire on clan Cameron so the line is almost intact still as we get to this stage of the battle going back to uh, Mackay he said when the when the general observed the attack he called the Lord Belhaven he called a troop of horse to march up so you imagine Mackay was there with his cavalry and he ordered them to swing to the left of the enemy because all the firing of the guns had finished and he wanted the horse to get in where the troops were fighting to support his troops against the Highlanders and he called up the second horse 
to swing to the right and to get in amongst the fighting. But he said scarcely had Belhaven got to the front of the line when they had orders to wheel to the flank and the very enemy turned away from the place where they saw the horse coming. But contrary to orders, they presently turned about and retreated and fled, as did Kenmore's regiment and half of Leland's battalion as well. So the, his army was disintegrating around him. And he goes on, the general obs observing the horse had come to a standstill he, Mackay, disengaged himself out of the crowd of Highlanders who were there, calling to the officers of the horse to follow him. He spurred his horse through the enemy, where nobody followed but one of his servants, whose horse was shot away. And once again, Mackay laments the lack of cavalry. He says, were he, Mackay, judged by the way the Highlanders made for him alone, though alone, if he had 50 resolute horse such as Colchester's, he would certainly have recovered all, recovered the whole battle, notwithstanding the foot soldiers who were fleeing overall, fully routed. The sooner upon the left which was not attacked, he said he doesn't believe that the left of his army was attacked. He believes, the, he says, because the right of the enemy had not budged from the ground when where they had last engaged. So Lochiel told us the trigger for the Jacobite attack was the Maclean's on the right moving and starting their attack. But Mackay doesn't believe that the right wing of the Jacobite army moved at all. So it just shows you how two people at one battle see different things. And it's probably not surprising because the time it took for the Highlanders and their horse to fly down, the, flee down the hill it was pretty fast and so very quickly you're watching a lot you're not sure how you're going to absorb, survive yourself. Mackay tells us having passed through the crowd of the attacking Highlanders he turned about to see how, how matters stood and found that all of his left wing of his army had disappeared given way and he says so that in the twinkle of an eye our men as well as our enemy were out of sight and gone, gone pal mal to the river where the baggage train stood. So all of a sudden the Highlanders charged down, Mackay's army, the Scottish government army, the William and Mary army disintegrated for him. And Lochiel tells us about the Highlanders. He said the Highlanders had an absolute victory. The pursuit was so warm that few of the enemy escaped nor was the victory cheap bought, for they, the Highland clans, he said, lost near one third of their number, which did not amount fully to 2,000 before the engagement. So they lost slightly over 600 men. And if we go back to Mackay, he tells us, at which sad spectacle it may be easily judged how he was surprised to see a view of himself alone upon the field because all his army had disappeared and the, and the Jacobites. But looking further to the right, he spied a small group of redcoats and he galloped over to, and he found them to be Earl of Leven's regiment, commanded with its Lieutenant Colonel, Major and most of its officers, whom the General praised for their steadfastness but as we know from Lochiel they weren't actually attacked so they didn't have, need to be steadfast too much with any enemy around. So Lochiel tells us Dundee was so far outnumbered by Mackay the battalion commander of Earl and Even there was no clan to attack it so it remained still entire intact and because of Mackay's right there was another battalion conducted by Colonel Hastings. Only half of it was assaulted by Clan MacDonald. So I'm just going to take you now to show you the battlefield. So here's the battlefield and what do we have left? We have a bit of Hastings left over here, half of Levens, 
The Jacobite cavalry, one half run away with Sir William Wallace and not took part in the battle at all. And we have the 14 gentlemen of horse here. And this is our house. So that's where we are at the moment. We've got two bits left. Everything else has disappeared down. The baggage train is down here and the River Gary is here. Uh, of course, RA9 as it is today is here. And he said, the 16 gentlemen of horse, that's the Jacobite, returned from pursuing the enemy's horse who were much surprised to find Hastings and Levens men standing entire. So that's what I've just shown you. Part of Hastings and part of Levens battalions were standing upon the very ground they were exposed. And Lochiel and Mackay tells us, see, he, he saw the Earl of Levens men in confusion. They, they were intact as some of the men from other regiments had also joined them. So he instructed the Earl to get the men ready in condition to receive the enemy and recharge their firelocks, whom he expected at any minute, because he wanted to make sure the guns were ready in case they were attacked again. And he then said, part of Hastings, whose colonel wheeled with his picks or pikes to the right to join Levens. So going back to Cameron Lochiel, he said, the gentlemen of horse returned from pursuing the enemy's horse were much surprised to find Hastings and Levens men standing entire upon the ground. And the brave Earl of Dunfermline, with about 50 or 60 Highlanders, ventured to march against half of Hastings' regiment. And so the Jacobite cavalry decided they'd try and have a go at Hastings. But Levens, which stood at some distance, observed the Highlanders' motion, advanced to the assistance of Hastings' regiment. So the Highlanders, who were followers of the army, refused to engage. So it's interesting, Lochiel said the Highlanders were followers, but they weren't proper clansmen. That's the first time I've actually read that or re have heard that, so I'm not quite sure what he means by that. <clears throat> but he goes on and tells us that the gentlemen of horse found Dundee dying. This is what he said. The gentlemen of horse obliged to retreat on their way discovered the body of their noble general, who was just breathing out his last. The fatal shot was about two thirds, two hand breaths within his armour on the lower part of his left side, so down here, from which the gentleman concluded he'd received it while raising his hand up in his stirrups and stretching his body in order to haste up his horse that I related to before. So, Lochiel says, observing with there was still some remains of life, they halted about the body to carry it off. And this is where Lochiel earlier said, because Sir William Wallace and his men didn't follow, it resulted in, in Dundee standing in his stirrups with his hand in the air and being shot. And he puts that all down to Sir William Wallace's um, refusal to follow with his few cavalry into the battle. So back to Mackay, he said the rest of the Jacobite forces which saw among them the baggage at the river, they plundered it and gave them time and their runaways to get off the field. And he said, having joined Hastings with the rest of Levens' battalion, he vis visited a garden, which is today Arad House, as we know it, which was behind the battle lines. And he said, of a design to put them, his remaining troops, Levens and Hastings, into the walled garden you know, in expectation of succor in the, as a place they could hold out waiting relief. But he goes on, he said, but presently he, Mackay, changed his mind, considering that if re relief failed, there was no hope of escaping out of the enemy's hands by defending an enclosure so far from any support. 
So Lochiel said they found the enemy possessed in the gentleman's house, which is Arad's house. So some of the um, fleeing redcoat soldiers, government soldiers, William and Mary's army, Mackay's army, had occupied Arad house. And they said that was near the field of battle from which it was in vain to attempt to dislodge them. So I'm just going to go back to Mackay and he said, so exhausted his officers, he bid them take special care to march off very softly and um, where happily the enemy might not might let them require retire quietly from the battlefield so leading them softly down the hill he passed the river where he halted a little to get his men over and to observe whether the enemy will approach the river after him so I've got one more map to show you and this is the map so now everything had gone from the battle and you can see Arad House he'd inspected Arad House as what to do decided he wouldn't occupy it and he then marched down the baggage train was down here and he's saying the Jacobite clansmen were plundering it and down across over the river and then they marched away some of the clansmen would have gone down the pass and you can imagine they would have gone in all directions but this is the only some of the government troops have gone everywhere but this is the only part of the government army that remained intact so there's a clump there were probably nine wide no longer that three narrow deep group of men and they marched in a block and away so i'd also just like to say that the um a, there are accounts at this time that the clansmen offered quarter to some of the redcoat soldiers, the Scottish government soldiers, and so, so that they could surrender. But the big problem they had was they didn't speak the same language and that the redcoat soldiers didn't understand what was being offered to them because they were speaking Scots or English um, whereas the Highlanders only spoke Gaelic and again that just shows the divide that existed in Scotland at that time they were very different people very different armies and a clash of the two and going back to Mackay and he said a little before his retreat some four or five horsemen joined us and they were to, to serve as scouts during our retreat Lochiel said about the middle of the night the army returned, this is the clan army returned from pursuit. The enemy took the opportunity of retreating in the dark as, as they marched through the pass. And he talks about the Athelmen. We haven't heard about the Athelmen since they'd pinched Blair Castle, but this is them coming back into the story. We didn't see the Athelmen in any groups of Highlanders up here, so maybe they took no part in the battle. But here, on, when the enemy had been re, uh, routed and were in retreat, the enemy took the opportunity of retreating in the dark. And as they passed through the pass of Killycrankie, the Athelman, keeping still together as a body, attacked them, killed some, and made all the rest prisoner. So all the troops that Mackay brought with him, no less than 1,800 of them, were computed to have fallen upon the battlefield. So Lochiel said Mackay brought 3,500 soldiers with him and his estimate or the estimate of, of the clans who survived they believe that 1,800 of the 3,500 were to perish on the battlefield. If you add that to the 600 clansmen that Lochiel estimated would died that's 2,400 men died on this battlefield out of 5,500. Incredible death. You know, absolutely. It's a huge loss of life. So when we see this battlefield, we need to remember that. What took place there. And we do remember it each year. That concludes the battle and our battle with the wind and the cold.
on Sunday, seven o'clock, we'll be talking, we'll be looking at Mackay and Lochiel and what their assessment of the battle was, what the aftermath thought. They both tell us what, the, after the battle, their conclusions on the battlefield and what the battlefield was. And then on Tuesday, we look at both their accounts on the aftermath for Scotland. What did this battle of Killiecrankie mean for Scotland? So thank you all very much. I really appreciate all your comments and your feedback, your likes, and also if you share this to other people. So see you on Sunday at seven o'clock and we can get inside and get some warmth. Quisha. <laughs>